Hello friends. So now we have done the introduction, Dr. Johnson professed to Shakespeare, a monument to his genius, another a the dictionary of the English language, a dictionary of the English language, yes. So now what we are going to consider in the, this second uh, lecture is a uh, few points like what is the task, what is his goal, what is, why comparative method, what are the causes of his faults, simple things. See for example, task is, is that it is proper to inquire by what peculiarities, it is proper to inquire uh, by what peculiarities of excellence Shakespeare has gained and kept the favor of his countrymen. So, we are going to the task is that to inquire about the peculiarities, what are the special qualities by which Shakespeare could uh, keep his fame and also the favor of his countrymen. That's what I am going to do, he says. Then his goal, he said, to leave his author, my author, that is Shakespeare, better understood. This is what Boswell also said, James Boswell, his biographer. He testifies this. His, the, all the work that he did on Shakespeare is to leave his author better understood. And what happened because of, for that, what did he do, you know? He, he went through all the former editions of Shakespeare's works, starting with uh, John Upton, John Upton. A few editors of Shakespeare before Dr. Johnson, one is John Upton, John Upton. Then you have got the second Warburton, very famous Warburton edition. Second is Warburton, and third is Nicholas Rowe, Nicholas Rowe, and fourth is Pope, whom Dr. Johnson calls that little fellow, <laughs> Pope, fourth Pope, Alexander Pope, you know that, we have already seen we have discussed this now. Okay. The next is Lewis Theobald. Fifth is Lewis Theo Theobald. And fifth, and uh, of course you have got Dr. Johnson. So what uh, what he did was this. He said the former editors have slighted their predecessors. So my goal is not that. So then my goal always said to leave the other better understood. That is one of the attitudes of the former editors. He said they slighted the others. For example, probably uh, Nicholas Rowe might have slighted John Upton, Warburton might have slighted Rowe and so on. But here he says, Dr. Johnson says that what I have done is that all the valuable ideas will be adopted from every commentator that posterity may consider it as including all the rest and exhibiting whatever hitherto known of the, then he says, the great father of the English drama. The great father of the English drama. It's a very important uh, phrase, you know, the great father of, of the English drama. Understand? This is what he says. So what I am going to do is that I will go through all these editions, all the five editions which we have already which we have already listed. That is what am I going to do is that I will, other editors have slighted their predecessors. But what am I going to do? All the, that is, all the valuable will be adopted. Valuable comments will be adopted, explanations will be adopted. 
But every commentator, not one or two, every commentator, that posterity may, he is writing for the posterity, may consider it as including all the rest and exhibiting whatever is hitherto known of the great father of the English law. So it is a kind of historical criticism, we can say in that way also. It is a history of editing. See? That is his going to, his, uh, he says that that is his goal. To leave the, his author better understood by, it's not just saying this and that, but collecting all the comments, all the, adopting all the meanings given, all the explanations given, all the every commentator's remarks, so that posterity will, posterity will, as he said, consider, including all the rest and exhibiting whatever is hitherto known about the author. Understand? So that was his goal. And then he says, of course, next point is comparative method. He says, why am I comparing this? In nature you will find this, he says. I am using this comparative method, method because in nature you will see that. He said, you want to say, which is, uh, which is the uh, greatest waterfall? What do you do is you compare. You compare many and then you come to the conclusion that it is Niagara waterfalls. And then what you say, this is the highest peak in the world. And then you compare. Finally come to say that Everest. Like that is it. So in this, in the work of, in the fame of, or the lasting fame of an author, how are you going to compare? You have to compare the length of duration and the continuance of esteem. The other one is height, or uh, fall is maybe its breadth and its length and its uh, the height and so on. But what about an author? The length of duration and the continuance of history, two things. Length of duration, for example, 1922, T.S. Eliot published his uh, The Wasteland. 2022, 100 years now, still it is live, you can say. Discussion is live, the criticism, appreciation, appreciations and uh, interpretations and so on go uh, going on that's the thing so that is the length of duration and continuous what about homer writing in bcs even now chaucer so chaucer's characters some of these chaucer's tales stories have been taken by uh, shakespeare himself and as you like it, Gamelin. So there is a direct borrowing from Chaucer. So what is the basis to find out whether a, whether he is a genius or not? Length of duration and continuous of this. What mankind here long possessed, Shakespeare's place for him. And uh, you know, uh, Ben Johnson said, no? He is not of an age, he was not of an age, but for all time. To the memory of my beloved, the author Mr. William Shakespeare is a poem. To the memory of my beloved. To, this is a poem written by Ben Johnson. To the memory of memory of my dear author. Mr. William Shakespeare. So this is a poem by Ben Johnson. And there he says, he was not of an age, but for all time. Listen. So the former, therefore he says, length of duration and continuance of history. What man can how long process, they have often examined and compared. Homer has been examined and compared. T.S. Eliot examined and compared. Shakespeare examined and compared. 
And if they persist to value the possession, it is because frequent comparisons have confirmed opinion in its favor. What you have possessed along and frequent comparisons, still you, it, it, it is in its favor. This is in nature, you find the same thing, as I said, already told you. Mountains, for example, or rivers, or waterfalls. It's the same way you can see in the production of genius. Nothing can be called excellent. You can't until it has been compared with other works of the same kind. You have to compare it with other works of the same kind, otherwise you cannot call it something excellent. How can you do that? Now in the class, you know, for example, you have got 30 students in the class, suppose. And then, what do you do? You compare. Isn't it? Some of them may be brilliant at innovations. Another person may be brilliant at learning by <laughs> That is, there is any brilliant, brilliant, can call, can you call learning by heart a brilliant thing? I do not know. That is memory. Is there. <laughs> so, that is. so, whatever it is, so you come here. Yeah. And he says that in the profess, um, Dr. Johnson said, Pythagoras' scale of numbers was at once uh, discovered to be perfect. So there is nothing else to number. The scale of numbers, at once, perfect. No other comparison is possible. That's the only. But the poems of Homer, see, nation after nation, generation after generation, what has been longest known has been most considered. So the first premise, length of duration and continuance of history. That is the criterion for judging whether a work is work has excellence or not. Or whether, whether the work is of a first class or not. Understand? We have I do an example of TSL. I gave you an example of Homer, Shakespeare himself. And what about Marl? But not up to the level of Shakespeare. With poor blood. But whatever Mangan has possessed long, you compare with others, and then you will see that this is genius. So that is it. Then he says, already there is a tendency in, in, uh, in criticism to find fault with the ancients and praise the moderns. But you can, as you can see, the dignity of an ancient. Uh, Shakespeare has already gained. The to, uh, yes, sorry the, uh, the the other way around. Praise the ancients and find fault with the moderns. That is the character. So he says Shakespeare has already attained the dignity of an ancient privilege of privilege of an established fame, and therefore, and he has earned for himself a prescriptive veneration. Prescriptive means normative. He demands veneration. That is prescriptive generation. And, and, and he has outlived his century. See? And uh, his term fixed as a test of literary merit. He has outlived his century. He has fixed his term as a test. That means age as a test of literary merit. More than that, what do you want? And then he comes to, uh, and he says, new owners at every transition from generation to generation, from nation to nation. Whenever a century say, says goodbye to another century, Shakespeare's fame is kept intact. Plus, Owners at every transition from 1st century to 2nd century, from 16th to 17th, 17th to 18th, 18th to 19th, and so on. Owners at every century, and also from generation to generation. Yet, he says, he is, and uh, as, as I already told you in the last lecture, the transcendent and unbounded genius of Shakespeare stands the test of time. 
The transcendent and unbounded genius of Shakespeare stands the test of time. That is what Dr. Johnson is categorically asserting here. The transcendent, the unbounded genius of Shakespeare. Generation after generation, nation after nation, transition after transition, it is only made firm his esteem, his veneration for him. And that veneration is prescriptive veneration. Understand? But at the same time, as a balanced critic, Dr. Johnson does not just uh, say something, uh, say, uh, he, he does not, he is not satisfied just by playing with hyperboles and exaggerations like this. But in a letter that he wrote to Charles Burney, he said, we must confess the fault of our favorites, he said, to gain credit to our praise of his excellencies. Suppose you are only listing the uh, excellencies of an author, people will not believe you. You have to be balanced. You have to if there are faults, you have to bring them out. You should focus on the faults also. Otherwise, what will happen? He is a flattery also. He is only flattery. Understand? So flattery people don't like now. But if you say, see there are some points like this that you may have to note. That means there is some violence. Two of the reasons he gives is, one is carelessness. Carelessness. Why false? He is careless, he says. Shakespeare is careless. Carelessness of Shakespeare. In writing, in, it, is said, it is said that Shakespeare blotted. Shakespeare uh, did not blot even a single line. Shakespeare blotted not even a single line. Yes. And it's, uh, there is a story like this, I don't know whether it is true or not. He would write only one or two scenes of an act. First of all, there is no such division as, uh, as we have seen today, as we have today, act and scene and so on. He would write something and give to and pass on to the actors. As they were acting, he would be doing the second part of scene like that. And then the third part like that. Writing and giving, writing and giving. So he had no time for even bloating, using a bloating bill. Carelessness and rapidity. And second uh, reason he gives is uh, that is conceits. Use of too many conceits. Conceits is a kind of comparison. Like John Dunn's comparison, you know. A valediction for bidding money. The commerce, uh, commerce, commerce. Comparison. If, if they be too like that, I, I, I don't know, I forgot. Not I forgot, but that is not the point here, that's it. See? Uh, that is, I partially I forgot also. I have forgotten also. But even I give the act uh, 3, scene 5. In Romeo and Juliet you will find a conceit. That's better now. Instead of giving you the example of valediction for the morning, I, I can give you the example of uh, valediction for the morning. Sorry, uh, Romeo and Juliet. And there, there are a few lines. Extended comparison. Extended comparison is a, a conceit. There he says, uh, that is, uh, Juliet has, Romeo has just left Juliet and she is weeping and crying and the Capulets comes and conveys the situation. Thou counterfeitest, thou counterfeitest a bark, a sea, a wind. Thou, thou counter, uh, fittest, yes, a, a, a sea, a bark, a wind. So that's what she says. Thou counter fittest. A, a bark, a, a bark, sorry, 
एबाक एबाक एसी एविंड इसे इसे सो दैट इस दैट इस एक बिगिन्स ताऊ काउंट ऑफ इट इस एबाक एसी एविंड्स और देन फर्स्ट टिल द आइस For still the ice, I may call the sea. For still the ice, I may call the sea. Sees. For still the ice, I may call the sea. And then he continues. The, the conceit continues. Do ebb and ebb and flow with tears. The bark, the body is. Do ebb and flow, ebb and flow. Do ebb and flow. The tears, the bark, the body is. Look at that. The concept begins. It goes like that. The body is, and then he continues. He says. Sailing in this salt flood, he says, the winds, the sigh. Sailing in this salt flood, the sea. Sailing in this salt 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 flood, the wind, the sigh. The wind, the sigh. So this is a conceit. Next time we'll come at this. Sailing in this salt flood, tears, salt flood. Understand? Who raging with their tears and they with them? Who raging with their tears? And they with them. Industrial persons can take this down. This is a good can see can a can see an example for you can see. And they with them. Without a sudden calm will overset. Without a sudden calm, a sudden calm will overset. Over such, see the comparison continues. You know, over such, the tempest tossed body, the tempest tossed body. So she is crying. Uh, Romeo has just left, and the capulet comes in and he and uh, describing her eyes. Thou counterfeitest a bark. A bark, a sea, a wind. Your body is a bark. Eyes, sea. Eyes are your wind. This is another description. For the eyes, I may call the sea. Do ebb, ebb and flow. Do ebb and flow. The tears, the bark, the body is sailing in this salt flood. The wind, the sigh. Who raging with the tears and they and they with them, without sudden calm will overset the tempest of the body. So, it be an example for a conceit. Difficult, no? Unless you don't have that imagination, that power of imagination equal to that of Shakespeare, it will be very difficult for us to follow. But anyway, it's a, a beautiful passage. I think you must be. Uh, we must uh, learn this by heart so that we can. You know, this is something very. Really, what is it? Highly imaginative, isn't it? Very much, and very attractive also. I hope you have taken this down. Once again, I will read this for you. Thou act three, scene five. Act three, scene. Act three, scene five. Or you can put it like this. Five, scene five. Act three, scene five. So that is Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. These words spoken by Capulet. 
Yes. So I think that is a, an example for this. One of the reasons, one of the fault is this. One is carelessness. He's doing, he left his place to time and fortune. Yes. Towards the end of his life, he had become very famous. He settled down, he had plenty of money. But he did not bother about recalling all these texts. And he did not bother to, uh, some people might have went and told him that, uh, uh, Mr. Shakespeare, you are, uh, your books, your plays have been published and there are a lot of mistakes. And he, he, he might have said, I don't care whatever they do with it, whatever. I have done my work, so what, let them do whatever they want. But probably he must have said like that. So two reasons he says. One is carelessness and we will examine in detail the faults themselves. Now we are now thinking about the, the reason, the causes only. What are the faults that we will see later? The causes. But the one cause he says is confused and rapid syntax. Confused and and rapid syntax. Confused and rapid syntax. For example, a quad with a, a thought which quarter had but one part wisdom and there were three parts covered. A thought which quarter had but one part wisdom and there were three parts covered. It is confused the syntax. It's in Hamlet. See that? And uh, think of that. Uh, that undiscovered country from whose bone not traveller returns, puzzles a villain, make us rather suffer these hills which we have than to fly to those that we know not of. Thus, conscience that may cover itself for so long, and so on and so on. See the, the rapidity of movement, rapid syntax. Understand? And the second is the careless manner of publication. That is not his mistake, the careless. That is publishes careless manner of manner of this publication. What we are uh, doing now is we are finding out the causes, not the false themselves. Why the causes? So, the third is shifting fashions and experiential license of Elizabeth in English that we have seen already. No shifting fashions. Fashions and the experiential and experiential license license of Elizabethan English license of Elizabethan English shifting fashions are. And as we know, you remember, now I told you about this. Thousands of words were borrowed from left and right, from vernacular, from classical languages and all those. Understand? That is. And then for this, use of colloquial language. Many phrases, uh, they are allusive, colloquial and proverbial. For this, use of colloquial language. That was a time we had supremacy of Latin and Greek. So use of colloquial language was limited to or confined to the pub, the lower class people. See that? And uh, all those things, uh, those words used by Shakespeare, they were allusive, proverbial, and also as colloquial. Colloquial, proverbial, and uh, allusive. Allu these allusions refer to illusive superstitions and so on. Allusive, colloquial and proverbial. Proverbial that is, you won't find such expressions in Latin and Greek. Pro proverbial, allusive, colloquial and so on, you will find only in among the lower class people, not the upper class. Because the upper class people we have already seen, either they speak French or Latin or they um, understand things written in Latin and Greek and so on. And uh, the fifth one he says is that the, the rapidity of imagination, rapidity of syntax, now the fifth reason is rapidity of imagination. Because one thought comes to his mind just before completing that he jumps to the other, like a grasshopper. Understand that? So rapidity of imagination is subtle. The, his mind is full of ideas and imagination. 
So before he completes one, the next one comes in. So the rapidity of imagination which might hurry into the, the second thought. One thought comes, there is no time for him to develop that, then comes another thought. So hurrying, you can say, rapidity of imagination, rapidity of imagination, hurrying of thought, hurry. Hurrying thoughts. No time to wait, to, no time to stand and wait. Where should the sun? The world is too much with us. So, thoughts are too much with the Shakespeare. So, he has no time. Sorry. He's waiting. Explain the first one come, then halfway through the second one. Come. So, he has no time for the, to explain the first one. That's it. And the fullness of ideas which might load his words with more more sentiment than they could carry. Ideas, that's another thing. Ideas or you can say words loaded with meaning. Words loaded with meaning. Words loaded with meaning. So there are what happens is sometimes he has to use Words directly borrowed from Latin. That's it. Multitudinous seas incarnadine. He created a new word. Incarnadine. There is no word uh, those days first used by Shakespeare. I already told you now, when he compared Hollins, um, not Hollinshed, but uh, the Elizabethan translator, that is, uh, uh, his Elizabethan translator, there was a great uh, person, his, his, I just forgot his name, but when he compared him to Shakespeare, Shakespeare had used more words first time than uh, that great Elizabethan translator. I, I will look up and tell you tomorrow what is the name of that Elizabethan translator. And you directly, it does not have any direct bearing on this and that is, um, not Hollingshed. Hollingshed is the chronicle. Oh, yes. Ah, yes. Okay. There we go. So these are the, the half a dozen reasons he gives why Shakespeare's obscurity, recall, the reasons for his obscurity. The fault, the fault, so Shakespeare's fault. Now, these are not uh, um, the faults, uh, uh, these are not the list of faults that we are discussing. These are the causes, so to say. Two main causes, one is carelessness and the other is conceit. And then he says, you will find this, confused and confused, confused, uh, you can say confused and, sorry, uh, confused and rapid, rapid syntax. Uh, the Elizabethan translator's name is Philemon Holland. Philemon Holland, that is the name of the Elizabethan translator. I just never told you, know. yes. Philemon Holland. Because Holland and Holland shut, there is some similarity, you know, that's why I got, I can, I got confused. Okay. Philemon Holland. Philemon Holland. The great Elizabethan translator. Yes. So, compare, when you are comparing the uh, use of new words in English, you see that if Philemon Holland has used 25,000 words, uh, the historians say, especially this, uh, that Dutch historian of the English language, Otto Esperson. Otto Esperson, he says that uh, if, if you accept the fact that Philemon Holland has used 25,000 new words, then 29 or 30,000 words were used by Shakespeare for the first time in the English language and thus enriched the language. That's what Otto Esperson said. Yes. So, uh, obscurities, I uh, confused them uh, rapid syntax, confused them rapid, rapid syntax. Then you said the careless manner of publication, that is not his mistake. Shifting fashions and the experience and license of Elizabethan English, use of colloquial language and allusive and colloquial and proverbial language. And then you have got the rapidity of imagination, hurrying thoughts. One thought after a rolling like this, words loaded with meaning. So words, here, sometimes he use directly, too brutal. See like that, these are, these are things that everybody knows. 
That's it. But you know what happened is, as James Boswell has said, the faults and the causes of faults narrated by Dr. Johnson has not been superseded by any other author. Understand? So the genius, geniuses, the genius of Shakespeare uh, is it towers above all the greatest writers of the world, although there is a, a bit of exaggeration in that. So there is a towering genius, no doubt about that. And then Dr. Johnson himself says, if you compare the correct school, correct, correct school in Vedogamas, he is referring to the French school, Corneille. He says, Corneille, correct school, Corneille is a clipped hedge, he says, a clipped hedge. Shakespeare's is a forest. Cornell's character school of drama is a clipped hedge. And when you compare that to Shakespeare, Shakespeare's is a forest. That's what it is. Understand? It is, we cannot, as he says, that you cannot do. It will be, if you, what happens, if you do not list the faults of an author, as the, Dr. Johnson says, to be balanced, he says, it is, it will be, uh, uh, it, it will be an irresponsible display of uh, flattery, he says. So that's why he dared into this. That's why he launched, in, launched his, his genius, so to say, into this, that is searching and finding out the mistakes, the faults of Shakespeare. Use of language, use of uh, syntax, use of thoughts, use of conceits, then carelessness of obligation, Shakespeare never published anything, I think, but maybe publishes uh, a false because of these excellencies of Shakespeare is eclipsed by his false. But at the same time, we cannot say that false are defects. For you, false are not defects. His false and virtues, one set piece. Papa, just as you have got a cake in, if you have got a cake, a very sweet cake, some parts will be uh, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes some parts might go wrong, a little bit of thing will go wrong. In somewhere you may not have enough food there, somewhere the sugar might not have gotten, so it's like that. But as a whole, when you see, just now when we discuss the Pope, we say, don't look for minor faults, but look at the whole thing. When you are looking at the and appreciating uh, Taj Mahal, don't look for minor spots here and there, but look at the whole thing and then you appreciate it. Like that, Shakespeare, you must approach Shakespeare in that way. That is what Dr. Johnson also says. Understand? So I hope that you are followed, you are following my uh, second lecture on Dr. Johnson. Tomorrow on which we will take up uh, what are the excellencies, why excellencies, and then what are the faults, how to compare, uh, how to uh, strike a balance between faults and uh, excellencies of Shakespeare. Already we have seen many uh, statements like this, he was not of an age but of all times. Then we saw Cornell's drama and uh, Shakespeare's drama. Cornell's is a clipped hedge while Shakespeare's is a forest. We saw. Yes. So like that we have seen many comparisons already. And uh, merit of Dr. Johnson. The merit, the superb merit, you can say, is adopt, collecting all the editions and using the and taking the best out of them. The common, the, uh, the, common, uh, the meanings explained there, the notes given there, the commentaries given by such people. We have seen about five of this now. We have seen John Upton, we have seen Warburton Shakespeare, then Nicholas Rowe, then we saw uh, that is. Um, Lewis Theobald, and you also, oh, there is another, oh, there is another, that is Hemings and Connell, Hemings and Connell. So half a dozen people will see before him. So all these things he saw, he went through, yes, that is what we see, we saw already, you know, the stupendous work, the task we saw, his God we know, why Kamal Dina there we saw, why, we are justifying, because in nature it is like that, 
Then he says, the faults there are two, obscurity, that is uh, carelessness and conceit. Conceit, one example you have already seen. Then we saw half a dozen faults like this. Uh, causes, uh, half a dozen causes for the faults, that is confused, etc, etc, I have already uh, given to you. And then we saw some a comparison between French drama and Shakespeare's song. I think that you have been following, you are enjoying my classes. Thank you very much for listening. So we will have uh, another session of listening, present listening in the near future. Till then, bye. Have a nice day. Enjoy your time.